Hey, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to be with you. We're going to praise our God. Let's stand together. Yeah. with me. Come on. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. I'm walking down these desert roads. Water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. You're forgiven. Chapel. 
this is your first time, if you're watching online, it's good to be with you. We're going to lift our hands, we're going to lift our voices. Our God is worthy to be praised. There's nothing that he can't do. Sing this with me. Yeah, just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Yeah, just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Yeah, just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Yeah, just one touch, my eyes were open to see. Their heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Well, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do.
Let's praise his name together. Come on. Who has the power to raise the dead? And who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. And who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. His name is Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King, almighty Lord, saints and angels all. The shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high your name cannot be
all to peace The storm surrounding me Let it break Let your name still Call the sea to still The rage in me to still Every way
of all of our praise. Would you be with us this morning? Would you meet us, Lord, where we're at, what we're dealing with, the struggles and the frustrations of this life, Lord? Would you meet us? Would you strengthen us? Would you build us up? Would you give us your peace, Father? We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. And everyone said together, yeah. praise God. You guys can have a seat. But he was also not just uh, a fellow elder, he was my friend. You know, he was there to, to greet us when we brought home the new babies. When we had a flood at our house, he was there to help clean things up. When I had to move my office, he was there to carry things from one location to another. He even helped edit the term papers for my children. In Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, we read, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Bob was a friend and he was a brother, but he was also gifted. He was, um, you know, his greatest impact was in his teaching and he loved doing it. I told him he was one of the smartest people I know and if this whole preaching thing didn't work out for him, I thought he'd make a great lawyer. <laughs> but the preaching thing did work out for him. Because Bob had a gift and he let the Holy Spirit use that gift in him. He was able to make the Word of God clear and understandable and practical and personal and life-changing. And I think, Brian, you can attest to that. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Buckley. I am an elder here. And uh, believe this, uh, Bob McCoy helped to start me on that path through faithful works, through love, he brought me to the enduring hope of Jesus Christ. You know, in uh, May of 2007, in the words of uh, David Crowder, I stumbled in here like a prodigal child. Without an appointment, without, any, uh, without anything other than the sin that was covering me, and I I knocked on his door and said, can I talk to you? And I don't know what he had to do that day, but he made time for me. And he made time for me for the following decade, every week almost. If not in study, in a cup of coffee, in a lunch, he was truly God's servant. So I have been served by him. And he just reflected the Lord Jesus Christ in such a strong way. I will miss the laughter. Uh, I'll miss the accountability. Is such a strong influence, not just in my life, but what I'm standing here saying to you goes for scores and scores of people over decades. He was indeed a faithful servant to the Lord. I thank God for putting him in my path and understand that
that that was God's plan. Tim, would you pray for us? Our God and our Father, we just uh, thank you that you are a sovereign God and you know the perfect time for everything. Lord, we thank you for um, your, your servant Bob and for the impact that he's had on my life and the lives of those who came here, Lord, and, and many others that we don't even know about. We just thank you that he was a vessel who was willing to be used and filled by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that that example would be an example to us as we go forward, Lord, the desire to reflect your son to a needy world. Lord, um, I know that he's there now and that um, you're, you're saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, as we go forward today, we pray that we would have that same desire to want to share you, to make your plan of salvation clear to all those around us. Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough to give us a servant like Bob McCoy. And so, Lord, now we just pray that you would be glorified through all that has transpired here. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you all want to greet one another and those of you online, uh, you know, send out your text of greeting, um, good morning. Good morning to you. Um, it is my privilege to introduce to you a homegrown GB seer, um, a young adult who has had some exciting things going on in her life, Riley Barnes. Riley, I have traveled internationally with your dad. I've traveled internationally with your, your brother. I have not traveled with you. I've gotten to know you, and I've really had a great time doing that. So you are a recent college grad. Tell us what's been going on. Yeah, I just graduated in May from UConn with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, but even, thank you. <laughs> um, but even right before college and throughout the college um, experience, I really felt drawn toward teaching. And I also was involved in many Christian ministries like crew. Um, and I just felt God also pulling me toward teaching, gifting me in teaching in some ways, as well as um, ministry and spiritual growth with my peers. I really enjoyed. And so I did choose engineering because money, but then I kind of regretted it because I was like, what if God wanted me to be a teacher? God, I'm graduating and I'm not sure of what you have for me. And so I was just left with a lot of questions in the final months of my schooling. And so uh, what Riley has done is chosen to take a one-year program. She is connecting with Crew, which was, used to be Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, she will be heading to South Africa. And uh, tell us exactly what's going to be going. That's a map of South Africa and where she'll be going, by the way. Tell us, tell us what you're going to be doing. Yeah, so I never thought I'd be called to missions, but God worked in crazy ways in the last couple months. And... Um, I'm going to be going to Pretoria, South Africa, working with crew, formerly known as Campus Crusade. Um, and I will be working with college students, doing college ministry on the University of Pretoria. Um, and I will also be working with high schoolers to help tutor them and get them into college if they want to go. Okay, so just quickly, tell us what's going to be happening with uh, the, co the campus ministry. Yeah, so campus ministry is pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to be, like I said, at the University of Pretoria, and I'll be working with staff who's in place there from CREW. We're going to be meeting with students on a daily basis in campus. There are students already involved in CREW that we're going to be discipling and growing and meeting with on a regular basis, as well as doing campus outreach, evangelism, um, and just really trying to grow the Christian movement and atmosphere on that campus. 
Yeah, and that's, that is uh, an exciting thing in itself, but she's going to double that with another job, and she's going to be working with a, a project called the Mamelodi Initiative. Mamelodi is an area that is um, uh, one of the things that used to be covered by apartheid back in the day. It is still an area of um, primarily a black community, primarily underserved. And uh, uh, tell us about this Mamelodi in Initiative that you'll be involved with. Yeah, I'm really excited about this part. Crew's been partnering with the Mamelodi Initiative for many years now, and what we do is we're assigned three to five high schoolers a week that we're going to be tutoring after school, and these are high schoolers who want to get into college, but they just don't have the educational means or funding in their own schools to get them all the way there. At this point, only about one in 50 students from this region actually make it to college, and so we're trying to bridge that gap and this program's been really successful with that in the past and so I'm excited to keep working with them and then in June we're going to have a three week intensive kind of like summer camp where we just rent out a whole college campus. These high schoolers come and th like hundreds of them come and it's completely free to them and we just mentor and tutor them and we also get a chance to share the gospel with them at this camp so really excited about working with them. Yeah it's interesting isn't it the way God blends our passions and puts them into points of ministries. So that's exciting, South Africa. How can we pray for you? Yeah, so there are a couple things. Um, definitely safety and travel and being there. Um, COVID restrictions, as of right now, we are able to get visas to go, which is really exciting. We were unsure about that like a month ago. Um, but just prayers for that process and that we'll also have access through COVID to these students because um, the restrictions on campuses are pretty high still and then um, yeah just prayers for our team's spiritual readiness that our hearts of the people coming with me here as well as the people we'll be meeting with there will be prepped in advance and um, yeah just trusting in God's timing for everything <laughs> taking it a day at a time <laughs> I like the and uh, yeah anyway yeah. <laughs> that's really exciting why don't we pray um, for Riley. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to um, um, support Riley. We thank you that you have provided for her financially. Uh, pray for her spiritual growth, uh, her spiritual protection for issues of safety. And Lord, we want to lift her up as she heads out in January to this new experience for a year. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. Good morning, GBC. My name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here. I always love, I was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ in college, and it's funny, whenever you change a name for like 15 years, it actually makes the name longer, because you got to say crew, formerly Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, just how it works out. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, can we give our worship team a clap? Yeah. I also just want to add, um, uh, as, as they shared about, about Bob McCoy, um, one, of, one of the ways that, that the, the people of Groton Bible Chapel have been enormously blessed for decades is the longevity of our lead pastors. And some of you remember Dave Ward, who served for decades, and then Bob McCoy, who served for decades. And our lead pastor now, Gary, was born into the church, and he's been here 40 plus years and the average lead pastor in America serves their church for four and a half years. And so he puts that in perspective. And so we're just, we're just very grateful for the way God has, has, uh, has elevated people and brought them into leadership here at GBC. Today, uh, we're gonna find ourselves continuing through one of the shortest books in the Bible, Ruth, a fantastic story that packs quite a punch for its size, a story of grief and trial, a story of trust and surrender, a story of loyalty and grace. All right, the book of Ruth. And if you have your Bible, you can open up. We're gonna be in Ruth chapter two, and it's towards the beginning for once, right? Usually we're at the end of the Bible. If you hit Samuel or Kings, you've gone too far. You can open up there for yourself. I'm gonna do a quick recap of Ruth chapter one, and then Katrina over here is going to read Ruth chapter two for us, and we're gonna have someone be reading us through that each week. 
All right, so at the very beginning, it starts with someone named Naomi and Elimelech. And I think we got a slide. Excellent. I actually put names on the screen because some of you might get confused with some of, the, some of the family trees. So we get Naomi and Elimelech. They had two sons. We got them up there. Bam. All right, I actually forgot the name. Malon and Kilion. There we go. I can see it in the back, but the print is kind of small. Now, don't show the map yet. Don't show it yet. Now, they, there was a famine that happened in Bethlehem, and so they had to move to Moab. They moved there for food. And I actually went and I Googled. I asked the question, how far is Moab from Bethlehem? Because I was just trying to get a gauge, and this is actually what popped up right here. <laughs> so it had to be more specific, right? Now... They ended up moving to Moab, and we'll get to that map in a second, but when they got there, their sons got married, and so we have a picture here to Orpah and Ruth, and then by terrible circumstances, the men ended up passing away. And so Naomi tells Ruth and Orpah, who are from Moab, go back to your family so that they can remarry. The idea of being a widow, being a foreigner, going back to Bethlehem would have put them in a very difficult situation. But Ruth, in the midst of that, at the very end of chapter 1, with her famous kind of poetic verse, says, Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. And so they end up making their way back to Moab. And we have a map of the actual journey there. right? Roughly 35, 40 miles, something like that. And so they get back to Bethlehem, and chapter 2 begins with it being the middle of the barley harvest. And we're going to invite Katrina to read chapter 2 for us now. Ruth chapter 2, Ruth and Boaz meet. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a prominent man of noble character from Elimelech's family. His name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabitess asked Naomi, will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I find favor? Naomi answered her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. Later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the harvesters, The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they replied. Boaz asked his servant who was in charge of the harvesters, Whose young woman is this? The servant answered, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She asked, Will you let me gather fallen grain among the bundles? behind the harvesters. She came and has been on her feet since early morning, except that she rested a little in the shelter. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field and don't leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. See which field they are harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. She fell face down, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me, although I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me, how you left your father and mother and your native land and how you came to a people you didn't previously know. May the Lord reward you for what you have done, and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. My Lord, she said, I have found favor with you, for you have comforted and encouraged your servant, although I am not like one of your female servants. At mealtime, Boaz told her, Come over here and have some bread and dip it in the vinegar sauce. So she sat beside the harvesters and he offered her roasted grain. She ate and was satisfied and had some left over. When she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her even gather grain among the bundles and don't humiliate her. 
pull out some stalks from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. So Ruth gathered grain in the field until evening, but uh, she beat out what she had gathered and it was about 26 quarts of barley. She picked up the grain and went into the town where her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought out what she had left over from her meal and gave it to her. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you gather barley today and where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you. Ruth told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with and said, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Naomi continued, the man is a close relative. He is one of our family redeemers. Ruth the Moabitess said, he also told me, stay with my young men until they have finished all of my harvest. So Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, my daughter, it is good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Thank you, Katrina. If you're new, we don't often read giant chunks of scripture like that. We're doing that for the book of Ruth. It's a little bit different, but many of us are strangely unfamiliar with actually sitting under someone reading a giant swath of text. And so it is a little bit refreshing and perhaps a muscle that some of us haven't flexed in a while. Today, as we get into Ruth chapter two, we meet this character, Boaz. Chapter one was all about, again, Ruth and Naomi, but here we, we kind of pivot a little bit towards Boaz. And as we go through it together, we're gonna look not just at Boaz, but the hope is to look through Boaz as he is framed as kind of a typology, a prototype, a foreshadowing of Jesus as a kinsman redeemer, which we'll get there in a bit. I'm gonna reread verses two and three. It says, Ruth the Moabitess asked Naomi, will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone who allows me to? Naomi answered her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered into the field to gather grain behind the harvesters, and she happened to be in the portion of the land belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. Now what's interesting here in verse three, it says, so she left and entered and, and began behind the harvesters and she just happened in the portion of the land belonging to Boaz. The, the text literally reads, her chance chanced upon the land. It just so happened. Another contemporary way of translating this phrase is luck would have it. We have a woman who, with nothing, who is a widow, who is dis disadvantaged in every way as a foreigner, taking a risk to go out to the fields to grab food that has fallen by the wayside or has been preserved in the corners of the field. And the language here is pretty important. It just so happened right at the very beginning of the, of the book that there was a famine that brought the family into Moab where a son would marry Ruth. And it happened that the famine ended and it happened that they ended up back in Bethlehem. And it happened that she came upon this field of a, of a man who we find out later is gonna be not just someone who can fulfill the kinsman redeemer role, but also who's gracious at that. Dan Block, Old Testament scholar, he writes this. He says, by excessively attributing Ruth's good fortune to chance, the author forces the reader to sit up and take notice, to ask questions concerning the significance of everything that is transpiring. The statement is ironical. Its purpose is to undermine purely rational explanations for human experiences, to refine the reader's understanding of providence. In reality, he is screaming, See the hand of God at work here. One of the most important messages of Ruth, and Gary kind of brought this in a little bit last week, but you see it scattered throughout, is this idea that God is always at work. 
We don't just see this in the scripture. We, at, at times, as we look at Ruth, you get down into the details, but as you back up, you can see that God is moving and working, and it's not just there, but in our own lives as well. And in just conversations with people over the last couple of weeks, I've been refreshed and encouraged by what happens when you actually have your antennas up to ask the question, how is God working? I met a young woman a couple weeks ago. She's a fairly new believer who not too long ago, she, she had grown up in a non-Christian family, not religious, but she came in, we're having this conversation, and she's walking me through all the coincidences that led to her being where she is. That a family friend, someone who's very devoted to this church, had recommended she check out GBC at some point. That not too long ago, she ended up moving in with a sister who was in military housing right along the way because she was pregnant, she was caring for her for a little bit, right along the way. And so she would look over and see the cars in the parking lot. That she reached out to a cousin at one point. She started to read the Bible and ask questions. And she started reading it because she wanted to dis prove it. And then as she reached out to GBC looking at what sort of things she could get involved in, the only thing available was our apologetics class on Sunday night that worked with her schedule. She was wrestling through at that particular time how the Bible came to be. And she's telling me in the office that the first night she showed up to the apologetics class, the first one just happened to be the class where they talked about how the Bible came to be. Coincidence. She spoke with a cousin and asked her cousin, I'm reading the Bible. If I believe it's true, does that make me a Christian? And her cousin told her to look at Romans 10, 9, which says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the, and the day after that she made that declaration, the Bible app, the verse of the day sent to her was Romans 10, 9. I could go on and on and on. You see coincidences. You say, wow, God's at work. I also heard from someone else this week. We have some people who are dedicating their time to uh, Thanksgiving baskets and reaching out and doing nominations and, and, and pulling in supplies so that we can bless people. And one of the volunteers reached out to a number that they had gotten for a nomination and they reached out to the number and didn't get an answer and they kept calling for two weeks, kept calling the number. And... <laughs> Finally, they, they got a, a response, and it was, it was a young girl. It was a teenage girl in New York, and they thought that it was originally it was a child of the person they were calling, but it was not. Now, for you and me, you get a wrong number. Chances are, most of us are just click, like, oh, sorry, click. What did this volunteer do? They, said, they explained why they were calling. Well, oh, I'm actually a part of a Thanksgiving thing for a church, and I just wanted to, I was, I was calling because I thought you were a part of, and she ended up sharing about the sermon that was just preached that Sunday. And two and a half later, I got a call back from the girl saying, I've never heard someone talk about Jesus that way. And I forwarded it to friends. Can I reach out to you for questions? God's at work. Do we notice it? You may look at these things and say, it just happens to be how the dice fell, but Proverbs 16, we throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Did your work just happen to bring you to Southeast Connecticut? Did you just happen to end up with that set of coworkers? Did you just happen to end up in that apartment complex? Did you just happen to end up in that small group or Bible study with that group of people. I believe for, for many of us, if we can write off circumstances as mere coincidences, then it insulates us from responsibility to actually take any ownership or advantage of the situations we find ourselves in. But if mindsets shift and if we actually think through God might be at work here, if God had a hand in the co-workers you share a floor with, if God had a hand in the station you're transferred to, if God had a hand in placing you in that small group with that group of people in that classroom with that study, if I look at those situations as things God had a hand in, then they go from being coincidences to opportunities. God-given opportunities to serve, to love, to share about Jesus, to be gracious, to tell people about the gospel, to be Jesus in a world that needs him. 
As we look at Ruth and you kind of see God being at work, we need to be reminded today of a providential and sovereign God who is indeed not just at work in the book of Ruth, but at work in our lives and in the situations in which we find ourselves. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. God is at work. And a phrase like that, let's be honest, that can be really cliche. Had you gone up to Ruth when she just lost her hubby and said, God's at work? I don't know what she would have done. She seems like a very humble and gracious person. All right, we got people here from New Jersey. I know how you would have responded. (laughs) But there's nothing cliche about what we see in the story of Ruth, the devastation with which it starts and the redemption that ultimately comes. Continuing, verse four, we're skipping to verse, uh, verse four. Later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the harvesters, the Lord be with you, the Lord bless you, they replied. Boaz asked his servant, right off the bat, right? Boaz gets on the scene and, and he's, he's, a, he's a godly man. Boaz asked his servant who was in charge of the harvesters, whose young woman is this? That question could refer to who is she married to? Who are her parents? What clan does she come from? But I just point this out. He knew the people who showed up gleaning from his field so well that he could actually tell when someone different was there. The servant answered, she's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. She asked, will you let me gather fallen grain among the bundles behind the harvesters? And she came and has remained from early morning until now, except that she rested a little bit in the shelter. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field and don't leave this one, but stay here close to my young women. Now, one of the things we see in this text and the backdrop for this text is that God had given his people through the law, through the Old Testament law, God had given them a standard of love by which to care for people. And there was this thing called gleanings. So if you owned a field and people were harvesting, people who were both poor and people who were, who were foreigners from abroad could come and they would basically gather at the coattails the stuff that had fallen behind or the corner of the fields. And what we see as we look at the Old Testament that God has a heart, God has a heart, a love for the outsider. God has a heart for the poor and the foreigner. God loves those who don't belong. And it's through Boaz that we actually, in his generosity and compassion, that we're pointed to ultimately the generosity and compassion of God. Some of us get to the law, you read Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a little bit, a little bit easier for most, but you get there and you get lost in it. But we actually, you look through and you see God's heart for people. And Leviticus 19, he writes this, when you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. God's saying, don't hoard in your excess so that people who are less fortunate might be provided for. In verse 33, 34, he goes on, when an alien resides with you in your land, these are people who would have, again, been considered outsiders. They didn't belong. There was tension. Throughout the book of Ruth, it constantly reminds us that Ruth is from Moab, constantly. Why? Because it's inserting the tension that would have existed between the people of Israel and the people of Moab. But here, verse 34, you will regard the alien who resides with you as the native born among you, You are to love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. See a picture of a God who loves those who don't belong. The God of the Old Testament is very much the same as the God of the New Testament. In his law, he gives again that standard of love by which his people were to treat the outsiders, the marginalized, the ones who simply did not belong. And for some, it became boxes to check off. The law was given and this is the standard I got to keep. And so you could imagine the person who had the field and they did just enough to get by and to be able to say, that's fine. I did what the law required, but that's not what we get with Boaz. It's not what we get with God. And so as we see what Boaz, how he goes above and beyond again, and how it points 
to a God who went above and beyond people's expectations. Verse 9, see which field they are harvesting and follow them. He's, this is Boaz talking to Ruth. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? She would have been in danger by virtue of her position. That word touch could also be translated abuse or harass. This is one of the earliest versions of, a, of an anti-sexual harassment policy in the workplace. Right here goes scripture. When you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. Again, Boaz, above and beyond. You know who pulled water during this time? The women. When men had a need for water, the women pulled it, and the women gave men something to drink. Gary talked about the patriarchal society. What does Boaz say to Ruth? When you're thirsty, go and drink from the jars the men have filled. Ruth fell face down, verse 10, bowed to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor with you that you notice me, although I'm a foreigner? She says that shocked and surprised because she's done nothing to merit this. We're reminded again that God loves those who don't belong. In verse 15, continues, when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her even Grab grain among the bundles. Don't humiliate her. Pull out some stocks from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. Again, we see a compassion that stretches beyond the checkbox. It would have been very easy for Boaz if he was focusing on just gathering as much as he possibly could to say, okay, we're gonna leave those corners. That's fine. Don't touch those areas. And as you gather, whatever falls, don't turn around and grab it again. She'll come back. But he says, no, 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 no. This is what we're gonna do. The stuff that you put work in to gather, we're gonna give some of that over as well. Going above and beyond the checkbox. We see the same happen with the love of Jesus in the New Testament. We see a God in the Old Testament who, who offers love to the outsider, the marginalized, those who would not belong. We see it in Boaz. We see it as it points to Jesus and what he does to people because Jesus constantly goes to the outsider. Jesus goes to the Roman centurion. Jesus goes to the prostitute. Jesus goes to the tax collector. Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman. Josh Butler writes, Israel's king has always embraced outsiders and made them a part of his kingdom, lavished praise upon them. He transformed the Samaritan woman into an evangelist. He highlighted the Roman centurion's faith as the greatest he's found in Israel and asked of the lepers that he healed was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. What well, we have in Christianity, what we have in our God is, is what I heard one person once call a radically exclusive faith and a radically inclusive God. Let me say that again, a radically exclusive faith and a radically inclusive God. And so Ruth, who is a foreigner who has done nothing to merit any sort of attention or favor, she shows up and Boaz lavishes favor upon her. He does nothing to deserve it in a place where she would be rejected, where she would be cast aside, in which they could come up with any sort of criteria to, to neglect her or put her off. And Boaz and, and his inclusivity points to the radical inclusivity of Jesus and our God. Now let me define those terms lest we misunderstand. When I say that we have a radically exclusive faith. It's because Jesus is not willing to share a bunk bed in the house of your heart with any other idol or God. He's not willing to room with, with Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Buddha, whoever else you can come up with. I know not all of those gods. But as we have a radically exclusive faith, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever wants to come to God, gotta come through me. 
but an erratically inclusive God. And by inclusive, what I mean by that is is no matter who you are or your baggage, no matter where you've come from, no matter your, your ethnicity, your race, your sex, your sexuality, no matter any of those things, for the person who turns from the false promises of the world towards the unfailing promises of Jesus, from the person who turns from the false hopes in the world to the unfailing hopes that we have in Jesus, that whoever that is, no matter the baggage, Baggage, no matter where you come from, that you are received with a radically including love. Boaz received Ruth, a widowed foreigner with little to offer. Christ received tax collectors, prostitutes, and criminals. God loves those who don't belong. I say that because I've had conversations with people just in the past month who feel like their background has disqualified them from walking through these doors. And as Christians, it becomes very, very easy for us to care a little bit more about what we wear on our shoulder, for us to care a little bit more about looking the part and not wanting anyone to come through the doors who makes us uncomfortable when Jesus spent a lot of his time precisely with the people who would probably make us uncomfortable. God loves those who don't belong. And if that's you, if you feel like you fall in that category, I point you to Romans 10, 9, because that's what it means to say you belong. Confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. We continue and close it out. Verse 19. We get through this exchange and Boaz just lavishes his love, his care upon this character, Ruth. She doesn't deserve any of it. And then Ruth leaves and she goes back and she has an exchange with her mother-in-law. Verse 19, her mother-in-law said to her, where did you gather barley today? Where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you. And Ruth told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with and said, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. And it just seems like she doesn't quite understand the significance of this. And then Naomi said to her daughter, may the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Naomi continued, the man is a close relative. He's one of our family redeemers. Some of your Bibles will use the word kinsman redeemer or guardian redeemer. Gary mentioned this last week and we'll hear about it in the coming weeks, but this idea of a kinsman redeemer, when someone would be widowed, there could be redemption via a close male relative within the, uh, within the family's line so that women were not left out high and dry. It was a social safety net for 3,000 years ago plus. And so in the midst of that, you never know, you, you don't know who that kinsman redeemer could be Would they be a gracious or a compassionate person? Well, it happened that Boaz was. Would they be willing to fulfill the requirements? It just happens, we'll find out in chapter three that Boaz will fulfill the requirements of the law. Would that kinsman redeemer be willing to pay the cost? It just happens in the next chapter that Boaz is. In the coming chapters, he is willing to pay the cost. And in so doing with all of this, we don't just look at Boaz, but look through Boaz and see Jesus as our kinsman redeemer on the cross. That Jesus had to fulfill all the law on our behalf. That because we couldn't live the perfect life, someone had to come who could live the perfect life. And Jesus was willing to pay the cost. Namely, Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. And so when Jesus went to the cross, he paid that price for us. As we read through the book of Ruth, one of the things that's just so beautiful about it is how it constantly points forward to what's coming. And it comes out again in chapter three and chapter four. And so for you today, if, if, this, is, if this is new to you, if any of this has resonated with you, 
I ask that you would lean into that verse, Romans 10, 9, and see through Boaz as we look at Ruth to Jesus, who is the ultimate kinsman redeemer, willing to come live the perfect life that we couldn't and die the death that we deserve, that by declaring your allegiance to him and believing that he is Lord, that you would share in the eternal life that he purchased for you. God is at work, Groton Bible Chapel. I hope you see it. And God loves those who don't belong, including a terrible sinner like me and like you and anyone else who would come through our doors. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to continue in the book of Ruth. Lord, I pray, God, that we, uh, <laughs> that would, we would see your providence not just in the text of, of this book, Lord, but in the days of our lives. Lord, may we lean into that providence. May we have our antennas up for it. May we look for it. May we respond, Lord, with the situations that you've given us, even when they don't seem like gifts. And may we know, Lord, that we are held and loved by you as a people that shouldn't belong, but that nonetheless do. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I got a couple announcements, church.